pages 253 to 269 of Refugee, chapters 43, 44, and 45. Joseph, somewhere on the Atlantic Ocean, the year 1939, 22 days from home. Joseph watched his sister splashing around happily in the swimming pool on a deck. Other kids chased each other around the promenade, watched movies, played shuffleboard. For as much as he'd wanted to grow up, Joseph wished now that he could join them, be a little kid again, cheerfully oblivious to what was going on around him. But he wasn't a kid anymore. He had responsibilities like keeping his sister and his mother safe. Papa had told him what the concentration camps were like. He wouldn't let that happen to Ruthie and his mother. Are you ready? It was Posner. He stood in the shadow of a smokestack looking around nervously. Joseph nodded. He had agreed to help take over the ship. He had to do something, and this was the only thing he could do. What about Schneidick and his firemen? Joseph asked as they walked. We've got a distraction for them down on D-deck, but we have to move fast. The rest of the group came together near the social hall. There were 10 men, including Joseph, and they all carried metal candlesticks and pieces of pipe. Some of the men were Papa's age, like Posner, and some of them were in their 20s. Joseph was by far the youngest. 10 men, Joseph thought. A minion. 10 Jews came together not to worship, but to mutiny. Posner put a small length of a lead pipe in Joseph's hand, and suddenly the weight of what Joseph was about to do was very real. Lead on, Posner said. Joseph took a deep breath. There was no turning back now. He led his fellow mutineers into the maze of crew corridors. Just outside the bridge, in the chart room where all the maps were stored, they came across Ostermeyer and the first officer. He looked up from the map cabinet with surprise, but before he could do anything, Posner and the other other men grabbed him and pushed him through the door to the bridge. Joseph was startled by how rough they were being with Ostermeyer, but he tried to swallow his fear. Taking over the ship wasn't going to be easy, and this was only the start. There weren't as many people on the bridge as there had been when Joseph visited, just one officer and three sailors. The sailor at the ship's helm saw them first, and he let go of the steering wheel to die for an alarm. One of the passengers got to him first, slamming into the helmsman and sending him tumbling to the floor. The mutineers quickly surrounded the other sailors, threatening them with their makeshift clubs. And they had done it. Just like that, they had taken the bridge. Joseph's heart raced as he looked around, wondering what was next. Stretched out before them was the great green-blue Atlantic Ocean, and beyond that, still days away, Germany and the Nazis. Upon the little platform at the back of the room, the steering wheel teetered back and forth, and Joseph wondered crazily if he should jump up there and turn the ship around himself. Send for the captain, Posner told the first officer. Warily, Ostermeyer went to the ship's intercom and summoned Captain Schroeder to the bridge. As soon as Captain Schroeder stepped onto the bridge, he understood what was happening. He spun to leave, but Joseph and one of the other men blocked his exit. Who's in charge here? Captain Schroeder asked. What do you mean by all of this? Posner stepped forward. We mean to save our lives by taking over the ship, he said, and sailing it to any other country but Germany. Captain Schroeder put his hands behind his back and walked to the middle of the bridge. He looked out at the ocean, not Posner. The other passengers will not support you, and my crew will overpower you, he said matter-of-factly. All you are doing is laying yourselves open to a charge of piracy. Posner and and the others looked around at each other nervously. Joseph couldn't believe they were so easily losing their resolve. We'll hold you here as hostages, Joseph said. They'll have to do what we say. Even Joseph was surprised he'd spoken up, but his work seemed to put a little more steel back into the mutineers' resolve. Captain Schroeder turned to look at Joseph. The crew will obey only me, he said calmly, and I will give no order, no matter what you do, and will take my ship off its set course. And without that order, you can do nothing. What will you do, pilot the ship yourself? Joseph blushed and stared at the ground, remembering his crazy urge to take the wheel when he didn't know how it worked or where to go. Captain Schroeder helped his fallen helmsman back to his feet and led him to the steering wheel. 
The man was still shaking from the attack, but he took the helm and straightened the ship on course. You have done enough already for me to prefer serious charges against you, Captain Schroeder said, still frustratingly even keeled. If I do, I can assure you that you will most certainly be taken back to Germany, and you know what that means. Joseph steamed. He did know what that meant. But did Captain Schroeder know? Really know? How many Germans really understood what was happening in the concentration camps? Joseph knew because his papa had told him, had shown him when he jumped overboard and tried to kill himself. Joseph wasn't about to let his mother and sister end up in one of those camps. You would do that to us? One of the men asked the captain. You are doing it to yourself, Schroeder said. Listen, I understand and sympathize with your desperation. Posner huffed. You have no idea what we've been through, any of us. Captain Schroeder nodded. No, you're right. But no matter what's been done to you, what you're doing now is a real criminal act. By law, I should have you all thrown in the brig. But I'm willing to overlook all of this if you leave the bridge right now and give me your word you will take no such further action. Joseph scanned the faces of his co-conspirators and saw only panic, fear, surrender. No, Joseph told them. No, he told Captain Schroeder. My father told me what happened to him in those camps. I can't let that happen to my mother and my little sister. We can't go back to Germany. The first officer took that moment to try to pull free from the men holding him. There was a struggle. The other sailors moved to help him and the other mutineers flinched, ready to fight. Ostermeyer, no, Captain Schroeder commanded. Cease and desist. That's an order. The first officer froze and Posner froze too. The lead pipe in his hand still raised in threat. Nobody moved. The captain raised his hands. I promise you, men, he said quietly, his voice almost in a whisper. I promise you on my honor as the sea captain that I will do everything possible to land you in England. I will run the ship aground there if I must, but you must stand down and promise me no further trouble. Posner lowered his pipe. Agreed, he said. No, no, Joseph wanted to argue, but everyone else agreed. Joseph threw his pipe to the ground and left without the other men. They were going back to Europe, and there was nothing he could do about it. Isabel, off the coast of Florida, the year 1994, five days from home. They were going back to Cuba, and there was nothing any of them could do about it. So this was the last verse, Isabel thought. After everything they'd been through, after everything they'd lost, their climactic ending wasn't going to be climactic after all. Theirs wasn't a son, cu- son cubano with its triumphant finale. Theirs was a, f- a fueg, a musical theme that was repeated again and again without re- resolution. Their coda was to be forever homeless, even re- when returned to their own home, forever refugees in their own land. The U.S. Coast Guard had found them. Geraldo, Isabel's mother said, but Poppy didn't answer. He sat frozen with all the others as a bright white searchlight clicked on. A ship motor, a real motor, attached to a real propeller, roared to to life. Geraldo, Mommy said again. It started. No, he said. It's over for all of us. They're going to take us to Guantanamo. The searchlight swung around toward them. No, Mommy said. Hands on her bulging stomach. Her voice tinged with alarm. No, I mean, it started. The baby's coming. The head of every single person in the little boat turned in surprise. Isabel sat down with a splash in the water. She didn't know what to think, how to feel. She'd been put through the ringer, the elevation of leaving Cuba, the exhaustion of the storm, the horror of Ivan's death, the relief at seeing the lights of Miami, the despair of running into the Coast Guard ship and knowing they would never get to El Norte. And now her mother was having a baby, Isabel's baby brother. Isabel could only sit lifelessly and stare. She had nothing left to give. I'm not staying in that refugee camp at Guantanamo behind a barbed wire fence, Lito said. That's just trading one prison for another. I'll go back to Cuba, back to my home. Castro said he won't punish anyone who tried to leave, unless he's changed his mind again, Amara said. It was Lewis who saw the Coast Guard searchlight sweep past them on the water and point somewhere else. Maybe none of us will have to go to Guantanamo, Lewis said. Look, they're not after us. The Coast Guard is after someone else. Isabel watched as the searchlight found another craft on the water a few hundred meters away. It was a raft full of refugees just like then. More Cubans, Amara asked. It doesn't matter, Senor Casillo said. Now's our chance. Paddle for shore, quickly. Isabel spared her mother a look, then grabbed a water jug, carved into a scoop, and started rowing as hard as she could. 
So did Lido, Amara, and the Castillos. But be quiet, Lido whispered. Sound carries a long way on the water. Oh, Isabel's mother cried. Shh, Teresa, Papa said, holding her hand. Don't have the baby yet. Wait until we get to Florida. Isabel's mother gritted her teeth and nodded, tears welling in her eyes. The lights of Miami got closer, but they were still so far away. Isabel glanced behind her in the darkness. She could pick out the lights of the Coast Guard ship alongside another dark raft. Shadowy figures were moving back and forth between the two. They were taking the refugees on board to send them back to Cuba. Her mother cried, her voice like a cannon shot in the quiet. Row, row, Senor Casillo whispered. They were so close. Isabel could see which hotel rooms had their lights on and which were off. Could hear bongos beating out a rhythm over the water. A rumba. The current's taking us north, Lewis whispered. We're going to miss it. It doesn't matter. As long as we're standing on land, we're safe, Lido said, his voice thin from exertion. We just can't be caught on the water. Row! Isabel's mother screamed, her voice booming out across the water. Beep, beep! The Coast Guard cutter made the same sound as before, and its searchlight lit up their boat. They'd found them. No, Isabel's mother sobbed. No, I won't have my baby. I want to have my baby in El Norte. Row, Senor Castillo yelled, giving up entirely on being quiet. Behind them, the Coast Guard's cutter's motor roared. Isabel churned at the water, bending her flimsy jug paddle in desperation. Tears running down her face from sorrow or fear or exhaustion. She didn't know. All she knew was that they were still too far from shore. The Coast Guard ship was going to catch them before they reached Miami. Mahmoud, Hungary, the year 2015, 16 days from home. Sirens, soldiers shouting through bullhorns, screams, explosions. Mahmoud was barely aware of everything that was happening around him. He lay on the ground, curled into a ball, trying desperately to draw a breath that would not come. His eyes felt like bees had stung them, and his nose was a streaming cauldron of burning chemicals. He made a choking, gurgling sound that was somewhere between a shriek and a whimper. After everything, he was going to die here on the border between Serbia and Hungary. Rough hands pulled Mahmoud from the ground and dragged him away, his sneakers twisting and scraping on the dirt road. He still couldn't see a thing, couldn't force his eyes open, but he felt his chest beginning to work again, the barest tendrils of air reaching his lungs. He drank the air greedily. Then he was thrown to the ground and someone pulled his hands behind him and tied them together with a thin piece of plastic. It cinched painfully tight and Mahmoud was lifted again and rolled onto the flat metal bed of a truck. He lay there, still gasping for breath, the plastic zip tie cutting angrily into his wrists as more people were tossed into the truck beside him. Then Mahmoud heard the truck's door slam and the engine start and they were moving. Mahmoud's breathing finally came back to something like normal and he was able to sit up and open his bleary eyes. There were no windows in the van and it was dark, but Mahmoud was able to see the other nine men with him, all of them red-eyed and crying and coughing from the tear gas, and all of them handcuffed with zip ties, including Mahmoud's father. Dad, Mahmoud cried. He worked his way across the floor of the bouncing van and on his knees and fell into his father. They put their heads together. Where are Mom and Walid? Mahmoud asked. I don't know. I lost them in the chaos, Dad said. His eyes were red-ringed and his face was wet from tears and snot. He looked terrible and Mahmoud realized he must look just as bad. <clears throat> Mahmoud thought the van would stop soon, but it drove on and on. Where do you think we're going? Mahmoud asked. I don't know. I can't reach my phone, he said but we've been in this van for a long time. Maybe they're taking us to Austria. No, one of the other men said. They're taking us to prison. Prison? For what, Mahmoud wondered. We're just refugees. We haven't done anything wrong. The van stopped and Mahmoud and the other refugees were unloaded into a building. One of the other soldiers called an immigration detention center, but Mahmoud could tell it was really a prison. It was a long single story building with a barbed wire fence surrounding it guarded by Hungarian soldiers with automatic rifles. A soldier cut the zip tie off Mahmoud's wrist. Mahmoud expected the relief to be instant, but his then, instead his hands went from numb to on fire, like the tingling needles he felt in his legs after it fell asleep times a thousand. He cried out in pain, hands shaking, as he and his father were hurried into a cell with cinder block walls on three sides and metal bars on the front. Eight other men were pushed inside with them. Up and down the hall, more prison cells were filling with refugees. A soldier slammed the barred door shut and locked it with an electric bolt. We're not criminals, one of the other men in the cell yelled at him. 
We didn't ask for civil war. We don't want to leave our homes, another man yelled. We're refugees, Mahmoud yelled, unable to stay silent any longer. We need help. The soldier ignored them and walked away. Mahmoud felt helpless all over again, and he kicked the bars in anger. There were similar cries of innocence and rage from the other cells, but soon they were overtaken by separated families trying to find each other without being able to see from cell to cell. Fatima, Walid. Mahmoud's father called out, and Mahmoud yelled their names with him. But if his mother and brother weren't there, they didn't answer. We'll find them, Dad assured Mahmoud. But Mahmoud didn't understand how his father could be so sure. They hadn't found Hannah, so what made him think that they would find Mom and Walid? What if they had lost them forever? Mahmoud was beside himself. This trip, this odyssey, was pulling his family apart, stripping them away like leaves from the trees in the fall. It was all he could do not to panic. His breath came quick and his heart slammed, hammered in his chest. I don't believe it. They took us almost all the way to Austria, Mahmoud's father said, checking his iPhone at last. It's just another hour by car. We're outside a little town in the north of Hungary called Gyor. Almost all the way to Austria, Mahmoud thought. But instead of helping them along, the Hungarians had thrown them in prison. Hours passed and Mahmoud went from panic to frustration to despair. They sat in the cell without food or water and only one metal toilet attached to the wall. All Mahmoud could think of was mom and dad, mom, mom and Walid. Were they in some Hungarian prison somewhere too? Or had they been pushed back across the border into Serbia? How would he and dad ever find them again? He slumped against the wall. I have to say, this is the worst hotel I've ever stayed in, dad said. He was trying to joke again. His father was always joking. But Mahmoud didn't think that any of this was funny at all. At last, soldiers with nice sticks came to their cell and told them in Arabic to line up to be processed. We don't want to be processed, Dad said. We just want to get to Austria. Why not just take us all the way to the border? We never wanted to stay in Hungary anyway. I sold him, whacked him in the back with his nightstick, and Mahmoud's father collapsed to the ground. We don't want your filth here either, the guard yelled in Arabic. You're all parasites. He kicked Mahmoud's father in the back and another soldier hit Mahmoud's father again and again with his nightstick. No, Mahmoud cried. No, don't stop. Mahmoud begged, but couldn't bear to see his father beaten. But what could he do? We'll do it. We'll be processed, Mahmoud told the guards. That was all it took to surrender. The guards stopped beating his father and ordered everyone to line up. Mahmoud helped his father to his feet. Dad leaned heavily against him, needing his son for support. Together, they shuffled in line along the far side of the hallway away from the cells. Men and women and children watched them with hopeful eyes as they passed, looking for their husbands and brothers. And then Mahmoud saw them, his mother and Walid. They were in a cell with other women and children. Yusuf, Mahmoud, Mahmoud's mother cried. Fatima, Mahmoud's father cried with relief. He stepped toward her. Whack. A soldier clubbed Mahmoud's father with his nightstick and dad went down again in a heap. Mahmoud and his mother cried out at the same time. Stay in line, the soldier yelled. Mahmoud's mother reached for them through the bars. Yusuf, she cried. No, mom, don't, Mahmoud cried. A soldier clanged his nightstick against the metal bars and she retreated inside her cell. Mahmoud's father got his, Mahmoud got his father up again and helped him into what the soldiers called the processing center. There, clerks sat behind long tables taking down information from the refugees. When Mahmoud and his father got to the front of the line, a man in a blue uniform asked them if they wanted to claim asylum in Hungary. Stay here in Hungary after you have beaten me, lock my family up like criminals? Mahmoud's father asked, fists clenched and shaking. Mahmoud still had to help him stand. Are you joking? Why can't you just let us go on to Austria? Why do we need to be processed? We don't want to stay here any second longer than we have to. The policeman shrugged. I'm just doing my job, he said. Mahmoud's father slammed his hand on the flat table, making Mahmoud jump. I wouldn't live in this awful country, even if it was made of gold. The policeman filled in an answer on the form. Then you will be sent back to Serbia, he said, without looking up at them. And if you return to Hungary, you will be arrested. Mahmoud's father didn't speak again, not even to make a joke. Mahmoud answered the rest of the clerk's questions about their names and birth dates and places of birth, then helped his father back to their cell with the other inmates. Mahmoud's mother cried out for them again as they passed, but Mahmoud's father didn't acknowledge her, and Mahmoud didn't respond. He knew that they would only bring down the wrath of the guards again. Head down, hoodie up, eyes on the ground, be unimportant, blend in, disappear. That was how you avoided the bullies.